On the very eve of the birth of the Third Reich, a feverish tension gripped Berlin. The Weimar Republic, it seemed obvious to almost everyone, was about to expire. For more than a year, it had been fast crumbling. General Kurt von Schleicher, who, like his immediate predecessor Franz von Papen, cared little for the Republic and less for its democracy, and who also, like him, had ruled as Chancellor by presidential decree without recourse to Parliament, had come to the end of his rope after 57 days in office. On Saturday, January 28, 1933, he had been abruptly dismissed by the aging President of the Republic, Field Marshal von Hindenburg. Adolf Hitler, leader of the National Socialists, the largest political party in Germany, was demanding for himself the chancellorship of the Democratic Republic he had sworn to destroy. Those are the opening paragraphs of The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich by William Shire. This episode is going to be about the first chapter of The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich. You might be wondering why. Why would you start a video and audio series on this book, The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich, a 1,200-page classic tome of 20th century history. Why would you undertake such an ambitious project? There are a few answers to this. I think the simple answer is that I want to learn together. I'm deeply interested in this time period. I'm deeply interested in the nature and history of evil. And so I'm going to explore this through this book, through this classic, what I believe is now a classic. It's It was published in 1960, William Shire's massive work, 1,200 pages of detailed narrative history. I think it's fair to say this is a classic. This has achieved classic status. Practically everyone has heard of this book. So I'm interested in the history. I'm interested in the nature and history of evil. I have a general obsession with politics, with psychology, with strategy and tactics. And I want to explore these in the context of the history of World War II and the history of the Third Reich. In today's political discourse, you hear the word Nazi and fascist thrown around as insults. I want to know if those insults are being thrown around in a way that is realistically reflecting the depravity or humanity of the people who they are being leveled against. For some context, this book was published in 1960 by William Shire, who, is an, who was an American journalist. He died in 1993. He was an American journalist who lived in the Third Reich for the first half of his of its existence. This book in recent years has come under critical fire by the modernist historical establishment. It's a historical book, it's a history textbook really, that attempts to to weave a narrative of the Third Reich, of the rise and fall of the Third Reich, obviously. It's attempting to weave a narrative and it's doing so based on literally tons, tons like like in weight of evidence that I'll get into shortly. And the new historical establishment doesn't care for this kind of top-down history. What they want is what's called bottom-up history. They think what's more important to, to historical education in general is this knowledge of how were regular people affected or behaving at the time of given historical events. I think that this is a flawed view of history. I think the most valuable things to know about history are the decisions made by people in power. It's inspiring to hear what normal people do occasionally in times of great distress or political upheaval, but it is not necessarily useful. I'm going to be reading this book not from the perspective of someone who's interested in what the average Nazi was doing during the rise and fall of the Third Reich. I want to know what was the psychology of the leader of the Nazi party, not just Hitler, but all of the leaders. What was their psychology? What principles were they using to derive their philosophies? What principles were they using to derive their strategies of enacting their philosophies? And also, how did they, what were the tactics that they used to achieve their ends? I won't say that I'm going to abstain from moral judgment because that's not true. I will make moral judgments on the author, on the content of the work, but 
I'm going to try to look at this almost from a Machiavellian perspective. I want to know what are the useful things that good people can glean from the psychology of evil people and also the strategy and tactics employed by evil people to achieve their ends. I'm going to try my absolute best to do to speak carefully about the subjects in this book. I realize that they are very sensitive. My absolute intention is not to offend anyone it is a christian imperative not to offend one another and i do not want to offend you but i do want to read this book learn the history as deeply as i can i want to teach you what i'm learning as i go through this book and i also want to speak the truth to you as it appears to me so one of the critiques of this book is that it's a top-down history my purpose in reading this book is not to get a bottom-up history i don't really care what the average german was doing i, I do care actually in a sense but I, that's not my purpose right now my purpose right now is to get an understanding of the psychology strategy and tactics of the nazi leadership how did they achieve what they wanted to achieve i want to know how it reflects on our current political discourse how it reflects on our american political system and how is it similar to our modern political situation and how is it different? Another criticism of this book is that it's a historical narrative. It really relies in a lot of cases on what the Germans called Sonderweg, which means special way. And the concept of the Sonderweg is that Adolf Hitler and Nazi Germany were the inevitable result of certain predispositions that could be found in the German people that had been instilled in them over thousands of years. Now, this is an unpopular notion. I am what you might call a compatibilist. So I believe both in free will and determinism. And so I don't think that this was actually not inevitable. In other words, I, th I think that it was inevitable. I think Hitler and the evils of the Nazi regime in the Third Reich were inevitable. They were inevitable because of the Sonderweg, the German people's sort of predilection and disposition towards authoritarian forms of government. It's also inevitable because I, I believe that in a lot of cases, evil is inevitable. Like in the book of Job, it is inevitable that Job was to be robbed by the Chaldeans of all of his earthly goods. Why was it inevitable? Because God has a plan and God's plan entailed allowing Satan to drive the Chaldeans to this act of mischief. And at the same time, Job has free will. Job has free will to not relinquish his faith in God. So I, you know, a lot of the criticisms, I'm just, I'm just sort of laying out the criticisms for you because I think often what happens is you'll get a, a critique of a classic book and the attempt is to discredit the book. But I think that actually the critique is much weaker than the work itself. This is a classic guys. It's 1200 pages. And it's, I think that really everybody should read it, especially if you're going to throw around the word Nazi or fascist periodically. So we've got the top-down critique, we've got the Sonderweg critique, and finally we've got the moralizing critique. So frequently in this book, what Shire will do is he'll describe a personality defect in the Nazis. He'll call it a personality defect, he'll call it a moral failing. So people don't like that he does that, they think that it's sort of subje subjective. I don't think morality is subjective, uh, I think that morality is objective. I think that drunkenness and uh, sexual depravity does contribute <laughs> to an overall atmosphere of depravity that makes it possible for individuals to do terribly evil things. So yeah, I just disagree that it's wrong for a historian to moralize in a work of narrative nonfiction like this. So now you know what to expect. You know to expect comparisons between the then and now. You know to expect an analysis of the psychology, the strategy, and the tactics of the Nazis. And uh, finally, you should also expect that we will get into the most gruesome parts of the war. As a disclaimer, I have not actually read the whole book yet. I'm not going to try to get through the whole book in one video. My objective is to step through this book, hopefully one chapter at a time, in no more than an hour per chapter. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to read to you the salient excerpts from each chapter, give a little bit of context from the modern viewpoint that may be salient or relevant. I want to talk a little bit about my own personal views as we go along, uh, because I am definitely processing this as we go. And I want to bring this book to you so that you will want to read through it with me and hopefully comment, tell me where I'm, where I'm wrong, tell me what I'm right about. So without any further ado, 
let's start with the forward. I'm not going to read through the whole forward, but I want you to have a little bit of context on the author. So the first couple paragraphs of the forward state, though I lived and worked in the Third Reich during the first half of its brief life, watching at first hand Adolf Hitler consolidate his power as dictator of this great but baffling nation and then lead it off to war and conquest, this personal experience could not have led me to attempt to write this book had there not occurred at the end of World War II an event unique in history. So this is Shire speaking from his personal point of view, just making note that he did live in the Third Reich during the first half of his exi existence, I guess about 12 years. We'll get into that as well. The Third Reich lasted 12 years. Shire lived there f five or six years, I guess. This was the capture of the most confidential archives of the German government and all of its branches, including those of the Foreign Office, the Army and Navy, the National Socialist Party, and Heinrich Himmler's secret police. Never before, I believe, has such a vast treasure fallen into the hands of contemporary historians. Hitherto, the archives of a great state, even when it was defeated in war and its government overthrown by revolution as happened to Germany and Russia in 1918, were preserved by it, and only those documents which serve the interests of the subsequent ruling regime were ultimately published. So what he's saying is the, the event that led to him publishing this book, The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich, in 1960, was the release of all of these official documents after the war had ended. So there's so many documents from all of these different branches of government. Uh, he says later that there were 485 tons of documents from the German foreign office captured by the, the U S first army. So there's also documents from the interrogations of the Nazis after the war. He also references other primary sources, especially early in the book. He references a book that was written by one of Hitler's like, childhood friends so he couldn't have possibly read all of it but he's a historian he's tried to parse through it and he's tried to create a narrative out of that he goes on to say in, in late later in the forward with such incomparable sources so soon available with the memory of life in Nazi Germany and the appearance and behavior and nature of the men who ruled it, Adolf Hitler above all, still fresh in my mind and bones, I decided at any rate to make an attempt to set down the history of the rise and fall of the Third Reich. He's saying that even though it's only been about 15 years since the, rule, since the war ended, he's going to try to write this history book because it's fresh in his mind. He remembers what it was like to live there. He thinks that he can do it justice. He's a journalist. So it's his job to write things <laughs> and he feels like he's ready. You know, he mentions earlier in the forward that oftentimes people kind of let things season before they write histories. Uh, but he, he's basically making the point that he didn't think he needed to, to wait to write this history. And, he goes on to quote Thucydides. I lived through the whole war, Thucydides remarks in his History of the Peloponnesian War, one of the greatest works of history ever written, being of an age to comprehend events and giving my attention to them in order to know the exact truth about them. I found it extremely difficult and not always possible to learn the exact truth about Hitler's Germany. The avalanche of documentary material helped one further along the road to truth than would have seemed possible 20 years ago, but its very vastness could often be confusing. He's a humble guy. He's admitting that there's definitely fallibility in this work. And, and uh, you know, I have seen critiques that actually include specific points of contention in terms of the facts being misrepresented or, or just incorrectly reported by Shire in this book. So I think that's just important to note that this is not a perfect book of history, but there's no such thing as a perfect book of history. The objective of this work, I think, is to lay down an authoritative and comprehensive history of a specific regime. And then he says one thing towards the end of the foreword that really, I'll just read it to you. And then you can see why this might excite someone, not only to continue reading the book, but also just to continue learning about this time period, especially if you're someone who is attracted to power, who believes that they need to do good work in the world, needs to influence the world in a better direction. There's one thing I think it's fair to say about Hitler. He didn't believe what he was doing was evil. He thought that he was moving the German people toward a more desirable state. Now, I disagree with him. I think that he was evil. His means were evil. His ends were evil. And 
that does not mean that he did not think in him in his own heart that he was a good person. And we all think in our own hearts that we're good people. You can't go and act out in the world assuming that you're wrong about everything. You do have to assume that certain things you got right or else you can't act at all. And so I, I, I can understand why if you just got your premises totally wrong, you know, if you got the premise wrong that the German Aryan race was the, the purest, highest race, if you got the premise wrong that the Jews were evil, then you would do everything in your power to pursue those ends. The problem was that his premises were wrong, and we'll get into that shortly. Shire goes on, he says, Adolf Hitler is probably the last of the great adventurer conquerors in the tradition of Alexander, Caesar, and Napoleon. And the Third Reich, the last of the empires which set out on the path taken earlier by France, Rome, and Macedonia. So you can see why this is an this is an exciting sort of sentiment. This idea that he was a he was a great adventurer conqueror. And, and again, I don't mean for this to sound like I'm trying to inflate his moral significance because I I want to be totally clear that virtually everything he accomplished was morally reprehensible. It was awful. It was evil. I agree with none of it. And when you examine history, knowing how great men came to be great men is useful for potentially becoming a great man yourself. And when I say a great man, I don't mean a morally great man. I mean an influential, important person. Another person that we could examine would be Gandhi, right? Gandhi, I think, actually was a great person, actually did do incredibly good things. And maybe one day we'll do a series on the autobiography of Gandhi, which I think is an excellent book if for 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 true moral purification. And I'm starting with this book because it's reading uh, what I'm reading right now. And I really wanted to start doing series on great books. The other thing that he points out here in the foreword is that the Third Reich, the last of the great empires which set out on a path taken earlier by France, Rome, and Macedonia. I want to draw a comparison here because I've heard guys like Noam Chomsky claim that the United States is an empire and that we are like a conquering empire. But we've never had a great conqueror. We've never had someone go out and conquer vast swaths of land. I mean, you could argue that Thomas Jefferson in the Louisiana Purchase was conquering, but really he just bought the land. So none of the presidents like went about to conquer land and territory. It wasn't their objective. We acquired land. We annexed land. We grew as a country. We did have a concept of manifest destiny, but we weren't an empire, and we are not an, an empire like Germany or Napoleonic France or Rome or Macedonia. Now we get into the book itself, The Birth of the Third Reich, Chapter 1. The Third Reich, which was born on January 30th, 1933, Hitler boasted, would endure for a thousand years. And in Nazi parlance, it was often referred to as the Thousand Year Reich. It lasted for 12 years and four months. But in that flicker of time, as history goes, it caused an eruption on this earth more violent and shattering than any previously experienced, raising the German people to heights of power they had not known in more than a millennium, making them at one time the masters of Europe, from the Atlantic to the Volga, from the North Cape to the Mediterranean, and then plunging them to the depths of destruction and desolation at the end of a world war which their nation had cold-bloodedly provoked and during which it instituted a reign of terror over the conquered peoples, which in its calculated butchery of human life and the human spirit outdid all the savage oppressions of the previous ages. The man who founded the Third Reich, who ruled it ruthlessly and often with uncommon shrewdness, who led it to such dizzying heights and to such a sorry end, was a person of undoubted, if evil, genius. I want to stop there for a minute because Shire acknowledges Hitler's genius, which I think is a referendum on his intellect and not a referendum on his morality. Uh, but I also just want to point this out now because Shire throughout the book sort of lets his biases come through. I haven't done an in-depth biographical analysis of Shire yet, but from this reading, from my reading of this book so far, I'm, I'm well into the second of six books. Shire is clearly a liberal. <laughs> he writes about the socialists very gently. He really, he clearly does not think the socialists were the bad guys here, uh, even though they were part of the national socialist movement. And so I think it's fair to say that Shire was probably a liberal, maybe in a more classical sense than we think of liberals today. Anyway, my point is that 
Shire admits in the first chapter that Hitler was a genius, but throughout the rest of the book, he's going to denigrate uh, Hitler's intellect. He's going to denigrate the other Nazis' intellects. And I think that he's doing it sort of out of a feeling a duty to say mean things about Nazis. And also I think that he personally actually does feel that way, which is fine. I think it's actually good to feel antagonistic towards Nazis. Uh, and I don't think it's actually fair to make a referendum on someone's intelligence without fairly analyzing both sides of the question. I think maybe one way to put it, it is nationalism inherently bad. That's a real question that could have come up in this book. Um, it doesn't, or at least I haven't come across it yet. Uh, is socialism inherently good? That's another question that could come up in this book, but it hasn't yet for me. These are questions that we can and probably should ask, but this book is seems to me so far to be written from this perspective of uh, socialists are good, nationalists are bad, I'm taking those facts as a given, and I'm going to write as if those are true, Just fine, it's his personal perspective, uh, and I think that the biases are clear, and when the, when the modern historians critique this book, they do so basically on the premise that he wasn't liberal enough, he wasn't focused enough on the common man, he wasn't sort of socialist enough, which I think is fascinating and, and sort of a, a rule when it comes to the socialist left. So the man who led it to such dizzying heights was a person of undoubted, if evil, genius. It is true that he found in the German people as a mysterious providence and centuries of experience had molded them up to that time, a natural instrument which he was able to shape to his own sinister ends. But without Adolf Hitler, who was possessed of a demonic personality, a granite will, uncanny instincts, a cold ruthlessness, a remarkable intellect, a soaring s imagination, and until toward the end, when drunk with power and success, he overreached himself, an amazing capacity to size up people and situations, there almost certainly would never have been a Third Reich. So, I mean, this is, again, returning to the critiques, when it says that... A mysterious providence and centuries of experience had molded them up to that time. That is the Sonderweg. That is the special way. That is the inevitability of this point in history coming through in Shire's writing. And then the sort of hero myth of Adolf Hitler. I'm, hero sort of has the wrong connotations. The, the, the myth of the great man, which I don't think is actually a myth. I think single individual men have an outsized effect on history. Uh, he just makes it clear here that without Adolf Hitler, there almost certainly never would have been a Third Reich. It is one of the great examples, as Friedrich Meinecke, the eminent German historian said, of the singular and incalculable power of personality in historical life. So, we move on to the advent of Hitler. We've looked at the Third Reich from a very, very high level. We uh, have looked at sort of a context of this book, The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich, of Shire's coming to write it. And now we're going to get really into the weeds here on the advent of Adolf Hitler, which is the name of the subheading here, and uh, sort of the details and facts of his, of his life, the biographical facts of his life. I'm going to start with a quote from Mein Kampf. Today, it seems providential that fate should have chosen Braunau am Inn as my birthplace for this little town lies on the boundary between two German states, Austria and Germany, which we of the younger generation at least have made it our life work to reunite by every means at our disposal. This little city on our border seems to me the symbol of a great mission. This great mission was to reunite the German Empire at the time, and we'll get more into this shortly. There was a movement towards reuniting Austria, reuniting Germany. Um, I think that Czechoslovakia and Poland were all part of this mix. There was a history. I don't want to get the sort of earlier history wrong, so I'm not going to go too much into it. But basically, there were lots of nation states, including like Croatia and, and a number of other nation states, Hungary, I believe, where uh, they were all part of one empire. I want to say it was the I don't even want to say it. Uh, maybe I'll look it up and add it like on the screen and they had broken up. Uh, history tends towards divergence. It does not tend toward convergence. I think that that is 
just a true thing because of entropy. And so this was taking place in this empire at the time. And Hitler really thought it necessary to return because he was a racist. He thought that the German people, the German race was the highest race and that it it necessarily by birthright needed to lead all of these other sort of like Germanic, I guess, peoples. And we'll get into that a little bit later. Let's look at his early years. There are many. This is one of the interesting biographical facts about Hitler and his childhood. He was born to a man named Alois Schickelgruber, or at least Alois Schickelgruber was born Alois Schickelgruber. And there's so much in a name, Schickelgruber. <laughs> there are many weird twists of fate in the strange life of Adolf Hitler, but none more odd than this one, which took place 13 years before his birth, had the 84-year-old wandering Miller not made his unexpected reappearance to recognize the paternity of his 39-year-old son nearly 30 years after the death of his mother, Adolf Hitler would have been born Adolf Schickelgruber. Adolf Hitler would have been born Adolf Schickelgruber. There may not be much or anything in a name, but I have heard Germans speculate whether Hitler could have become the master of Germany had he been known to the world as Schickelgruber. It is a sl <laughs> it has a slightly comic sound as it rolls off the tongue of a South German. One can imagine the frenzied German masses exclaiming a Schickelgruber with their thunderous hails. Hail Schicker Schickelgruber. Hail Schickelgruber. Not only was Hail Hitler used as a Wagnerian pagan-like chant, by the multitude in the mystic pageantry of the massive Nazi rallies, but it became an obligatory form of greeting between Germans during the Third Reich, even on the phone, where it replaced a conventional hello. Hail Schickel. It would be weird if fairness was not like a deep concern of mine. And it is. Fairness is a deep concern of mine. Justice is a deep concern of mine. If my name was Jacob, I doubt I would be nearly as concerned. Like, it just wouldn't. There's a book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, where it says the word that is most important to every single person is their own name. And it's true. And frankly, I think it's laughable to think that if Hitler had been called Schickelgruber that we'd be talking about the Third Reich right now, that this book ever would have even been written. Hitler's early life was extremely mobile, extremely tumultuous. This book goes quite a bit into sort of like psychoanalysis of him, and I think that's fair. I think it's fine to psychoanalyze people, especially historical figures who are dead, who are sort of public figures. And so we'll do that a little bit. Actually, real quick digression back to the name thing. So there's a footnote here. Hitler himself seems to have recognized this. In his youth, he confided to the only boyhood friend he had that nothing had ever pleased him so much as his father's change of names. He told August Kubizek that the name Schickelgruber seemed to him so uncouth, so boorish, apart from being so clumsy and unpractical, he found Hitler too soft, but Hitler sounded nice and was easy to remember. So even before he was named Hitler, this family started sort of went through like an evolution of Hedler and Heidler and eventually landed on Hitler. That, like, again, names are so important. Like, I actually find it kind of difficult to imagine what it would be like to change your name so much. Like I said, my name's Justice, Justice Epen. Just use a pen. I'm going to name my my first son, if I'm blessed to have one, just use a pen the third, right? Because I'm a junior. I just can't imagine what it would be like to change your name so often. It, I think it actually might speak... If we're going to psychoanalyze people, maybe psychoanalyze them from like a her heritable standpoint where like this family was moving around constantly, constantly seeking like a better sort of niche for itself. It kind of stands to reason that somebody who was brought up in that milieu would end up being uh, kind of a control freak. <laughs> uh, the father, Alo Aloy Al Alois, Alois Hitler. I wish I could pronounce that. Alois Hitler. It's spelled A L O I S. Hitler married uh, for the third and last time. The new bride, Clara Pol Polzel, would shortly become the mother of Adolf Hitler. So this is the mother and the father. You know, third marriage here that we're talking about. These were not happy marriages. Alois Hitler, the father, the elder, was a adulterous man. He seems like he was a bad dad, frankly. And it's clear, I mean, <laughs> look, if you're having affairs on your wife, you're a bad husband. <laughs> That's it. I'm I'm happy. The, the critics can criticize 
Shire for moralizing about the Nazis, I have no problem moralizing. Okay. If you're cheating on your wife, you're a bad husband. Okay. You're a bad husband and you're a bad father. Okay. That's, it's as simple as that. If you're listening to it right now and you're having an affair, you're, you're bad at being in a relationship. Okay. You're morally wrong to be doing that. So stop. (laughs) Adolf had no, he had, he had many siblings that died and he had two Adolf. I'm referring to him in the first person. So Hitler had, uh, Many siblings, most of them died. He only had two that made it to adulthood, and they were both half-siblings. He had a half-brother who was named after Alois Hitler. Uh, Alois? Alois? Alois Hitler. Jeez, that's a terrible name. So that's Alois Hitler Jr., I guess, and uh, we'll read a little bit more about him shortly. And then a a half-sister as well. We can sort of see some of the problems with Hitler's childhood. The year his father retired, and this is Shire again, the year his father retired from the customs service at the age of 58, he retired at 58, <laughs> the six-year-old Adolf entered the public school in the village of Fischelham, a short distance southwest of Linz. This was in 1895. For the next four or five years, the restless old pensioner moved from one village to another in the vicinity of Linz. Again, so this is the tum- um, sort of... Uh, tumultuous nature of Hitler's upbringing. By the time the son, Hitler, was 15, he could remember seven changes of address and five different schools. There's sort of a heuristic that stability is good for kids. You know, in America, we've really put the family first. The nuclear family is a, a, a prized and idealized condition. And one of the aspects of the nuclear family that's so important is the stability that comes with that. I think that we're seeing that this monster, Adolf Hitler, had a very tumultuous, unstable childhood. At the age of 11, Adolf was sent to the high school in Linz. This represented a a financial sacrifice for the father and indicated an ambition that the son should follow in his father's footsteps and become a civil servant. That, however, was the last thing the youth would dream of. Here we see the beginnings of Hitler's rebelliousness, his rebellious nature, which would persist until his dying day, frankly. Then, barely 11 years old, Hitler later recounted, I was forced into opposition to my father for the first time, I did not want to become a civil servant. The story of the bitter, unrelenting struggle of the boy, not yet in his teens, against a hardened and as he and as he said, domineering father, is one of the few biographical items which Hitler sets forth in great detail and with apparent sincerity and truth in Mein Kampf. The conflict aroused the first manifestation of that fierce, unbending will which would later carry him so far, or despite. Uh, seemingly insuperable obstacles and handicaps which confounding all of those who stood in his way was put an indelible stamp on Germany and Europe. William Shire really likes to write in very, very long sentences, and it's pretty difficult to read out loud. So this is from Mein Kampf. I did not want to become a civil servant. No, and again, no. All attempts on my father's part to inspire me with love or pleasure in this profession by stories from his own life accomplished the exact opposite. I grew sick to my stomach at the thought of sitting in an office deprived of my liberty, ceasing to be master of my own time, and being compelled to force the content of my whole life into paper forms that had to be filled out. One day, it became clear to me that I would become a painter, an artist. My father was struck speechless. Painter? Artist? He doubted my sanity, or perhaps he thought he heard wrong or misunderstood me. But when he was clear on the subject, and particularly after he felt the seriousness of my intention, he opposed it with all the determination of his nature. Artist? No, no, never as long as I live. My father would never depart from his never, and I intensified my nevertheless. One consequence of this encounter, Hitler later explained, was that he stopped studying in school. I thought that once my father saw how little progress I was making at high school, he would let me devote myself to my dream, whether he liked it or not. Children, one of the Ten Commandments is to honor thy mother and father. And we can see that Hitler did not do that. Although later he will claim that he did that, he did not do that. If you don't want to become like Hitler, honor your mother and father. And what it means to honor, by the way... To honor is to do right by, okay? It just means to do right by. It doesn't mean that you have to love them if they're awful. It doesn't mean you even have to like them if they're awful. It just means you have to do right by them, which Hitler did not. And he failed at high school. I think this is actually interesting as well. 
He started high school at 11 years old. He failed at school. This is actually something that we have in common. There's a lot here that I've noticed personally that I have in common with Hitler. And we're about to get into one part of it where I, I didn't fail at high school, but uh, I, I didn't finish college. And I have always felt, and I think it's justified actually, sort of a suspicion, skepticism, dislike of academia and academics in general. I think in my age, it's justified. In his age, I think per, for him, obviously, personally, he felt like it was justified. And so I'm going to read you some of the quotes from Hitler's conversations in the last few years of his life at the Supreme Army headquarters were recorded. And some of these notes were made available to Shire in his research for this book. So these are quotes all from 1942. When I think of the men who were my teachers, I realize that most of them were slightly mad. The men who could be regarded as good teachers were exceptional. It's tragic to think that such people have the power to bar a young man's way. One thing, when you start to read Hitler and you start to listen to the things that he says, you'll realize that it's not that he was just a stark, raving, mad person who was wrong on every possible count. He was actually relatively sane and had a lot of sort of normal tendencies. The problem with Hitler seems to to me, to be that he got some things so drastically wrong and then adhered to those wrong things with such dogmatic ideological intensity that it just drove this person to do the most evil possible things. I think it's fair to say that he was possessed by these ideas. He was possessed by these demonic concepts these racist concepts, these ideas that the Jews were the pro cause of all his problems, that the Germans were the highest possible race, these patently false ideas that people still honestly adhere to today. I see so much um, racist ideology online, especially from the dissident right. These ideas that there's some some sort of nobility in genetic purity, which is just a patently false idea. There's no such thing as genetic purity. I mean, genetic purity really just means incest, incest and eventually leads to all sorts of birth defects. If you're interested in why genetic diversity is actually a valuable thing, Google hybrid vigor and heterosis, which are the concept of uh, genetic diversity basically leading to offspring selecting the, not selecting, that's not the right word, but offspring generally display the best traits of both the parents, leading to uh, better and better offspring over time. Racism is just such a dumb idea. I, I understand why people <laughs> were racist, because sort of ingrained notions of tribalism and survivalism that come to us from a more primitive age. I mean, I am not a modernist. I don't think that all of our modern notions are actually that smart, but I do think that there are some things that we have figured out over the years. And I think that racism is one of the very clearly wrong ideas that came to us because for a time it was valuable to be, it was valuable to your survivability to be extremely suspicious of people that didn't look like you because for thousands of years, if someone didn't look like you, there's a non-zero, there's like a non-trivial chance that that person was a danger to your life and well-being. We now live in a world where most of the people who don't look like you are not actually dangers to your health and well-being. And in fact, interacting with those people and creating familiarity between people diminishes racism in general. I think that as we go through this book, I'm going to talk a lot about racism. It's such an important theme in Hitler's life. It, w it does seem to be the driving force behind this catastrophe. I, I absolutely cannot avoid it. Obviously, if you're watching this, you can tell that I'm a brown person. So I've got a lot of personal experience with racism. I've thought about it a lot throughout my life. I do not think about racism from the sort of postmodern intersectional point of view. I do not think of racism as a systemic problem. I think of racism as an individual proclivity. Racism to me is the tendency to believe that a race is superior to other races to base to base your behavior on the perception of race in others. That's what I think of as racism. To me, a lot of this sort of like structural racism, systemic racism conversation where like you can't be racist if you're not in a position of power. Uh, to me, that's totally wrong and a false notion about racism that's been propagated really for political and ideological motivations. I have the most 
unpleasant recollections of the teachers who taught me. This is Hitler again. Their external appearance exuded uncleanness. Their collars were unkempt. They were the product of a proletariat denuded of all personal independence of thought, distinguished by unparalleled ignorance, and most admirably fitted to become pillars of an effete system of government, which, thank God, is now a thing of the past. Man, it's pretty scary to read things from such an evil person that you agree with because... I mean, I've just seen it in my own life. The academics, the academics, they're unclean. They lack independent thinking ability. They're, they are the subjects of and purveyors of indoctrination. And I think honesty really does involve reading these things that someone who was an abject failure at life, Hitler was evil. I have to keep saying it because otherwise people will think I'm, I'm agreeing with him or complimenting him. I'm not. He's an abject failure. He's an awful, evil, monstrous, sinful person. P positively, probably the worst human being who ever lived except for Stalin, <laughs> right? So in no way is this an endorsement of Hitler as a person. This is simply reflecting on his ideas and saying that because he was a human and, and he was fallen, he was wrong about a lot of things in some terrible ways, and yet... He did say some things that were true and still seem to be true today. You know, our, edu our education system is a terrible failure. I mean, a terrible failure. People go through school. They don't learn anything about civics. You know, I'm, I'm recording this shortly after Mara Gay on MSNBC uh, made that huge mathematical gaffe where she she thought that 500 million divided by 350 million would give every American a million dollars is just so obviously wrong and MSNBC just let it go and that's where I'm coming from where someone like that who's on the New York Times editorial board is allowed to be on television like educating the masses and she can't even do like the simplest arithmetic frankly this this is a great quote they were the product of a proletariat denuded of all personal independence of thought, distinguished by unparalleled ignorance, and most admirably fitted to become pillars of an effete system of government, which, thank God, is now a thing of the past. These academics are pillars of a, the system of government. Like, our modern-day academics are pillars of a system of government. When I recall the teachers at school, I realized that half of them were abnormal. <laughs> So, like, it's it's bizarrely true. We pupils of old Austria were brought up to respect old people and women, but on our professors, we had no mercy. They were our natural enemies. The majority of them were somewhat mentally deranged, and quite a few ended their days as honest-to-God lunatics. I know we are all thinking right now of, like, teachers that we've had in the past that are lunatics. <laughs> I was in particular bad odor with the teachers. I showed not the slightest aptitude for foreign languages, though I might have, had not the teacher been a congenital idiot. And we'll get back to this congenital idiot shortly. I could not bear the sight of him. Our teachers were absolute tyrants. They had no sympathy with youth. Their one object was to stuff our brains and to turn us into er erudite apes like themselves. If any pupil showed the slightest trace of originality, they persecuted him relentlessly, and the only model pupils I have ever got to know have all been failures in afterlife. I suppose he really meant later life. I guess that's a pretty bad translation, most likely. Yeah, these are really interesting quotes. You know, I think a disgust, a disdain, a sort of a feeling of being betrayed by your uh, educational system can really lead to some negative consequences, which is actually scary for me as an individual because I've always felt that our education system has betrayed us and has done a really poor job of teaching people sort of basic character. So now this is a quote from Professor Edward Humer, who was the congenital idiot mentioned by Hitler a minute ago. He taught French in Munich or he, he taught French and he came to Munich in 1923 to testify for his pu former pupil who was then being tried for treason uh, for his participation in the Beer Hall push, which we'll probably get to not in this chapter, but in the next video. Hitler was certainly gifted, although only for particular subjects. He lacked self-control, and to say the least, he was considered argumentative, autocratic, self-opinionated, and bad-tempered, and unable to submit to school discipline, nor was he industrious. Otherwise, he would have achieved much better results, gifted as he was. That's... Professor Edward Humer describing his former pupil, Adolf Hitler. But Hitler didn't hate all of his teachers. 
Uh, some of his teachers did have positive uh, influence on him, apparently, and he does seem to admit it. it in Mein Kampf, Hitler says, It was d- perhaps decisive for my whole later life that good fortune gave me a history teacher who understood, as few others did, this principle of retaining the essential and forgetting the non-essential. In my teacher, Dr. Leopold Poch of the high school in Linz, this requirement was fulfilled in a truly ideal manner. An old gentleman, kind, but at the same time firm, he was able not only to hold our attention by his dazzling eloquence, but to carry us away with him. Even today, I think back with genuine emotion on this gray-haired man who, by the fire of his words, sometimes made us forget the present, who, as if by magic, transported us into times past and out of the millennium mists of time, transformed dry historical facts into vivid reality. There we sat, often aflame with enthusiasm, sometimes even moved to tears. He used our budding national fanaticism as a means of educating us, frequently appealing to our sense of national honor of national honor this teacher made history my favorite subject and indeed though he had no such an intention it was then that i became a young revolutionary wow 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 this this speaks so deeply i mean because on one hand we just heard how much he disliked his teachers who sort of tried to try try to suck the originality out of him and and it's incredible because if you go to ted.com right now the most frequently watched ted video of all time is about how modern public schools suck the creativity and the originality out of people how perfect is it how not perfect ironic it's ironic i guess it's 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 like this weird sort of serendipity that hitler was complaining about this 80 years ago and yet he was able to acknowledge that there is such a thing as a good teacher and and what did, why was that teacher good he was good because of the passion that he brought to the subject, the passion, how much he cared. And then here's the real problem, is that what that teacher did is exactly what all the other teachers, and certainly teachers today, are trying to do, which is indoctrinate, is indoctrinate. And so he indoctrinated Hitler with national fanaticism, and he created a young revolutionary. This reminds me so much of my own high school years. I had a teacher who, if he ever listens to this or somehow, uh, he, he, I would love to hear from him. His name was Mike Amaral. So Mr. Amaral, if you're listening, would love to hear from you, man. So Mr. Amaral was, uh, I think in law school when he was teaching me, or maybe he had already finished law school, maybe taking the bar, very, very smart teacher. And he, I took, a took several classes with him, AP world history. He taught me, um, you, he taught me civics my senior year and he would teach these things. And as he taught, he would always bring in these subjects that he was passionate about. One of the subjects that he was really passionate about that still to this day sticks with me. In fact, it's really informed my sense of of pacifism and nonviolence. So he taught us about Martin Luther King and Gandhi and these nonviolent revolutionaries who never failed. And it's hilarious because he was so passionate about what he was teaching. I'm, I'm sure that he was a liberal, uh, but he, he, he instilled in me a sense of nonviolence, a sense that nonviolence was the means to achieve great things, which is the exact opposite of what this teacher, Dr. Poach did to Hitler. Hitler was, was indoctrinated into nationalistic revolutionaryism, If that's a word, Amaral indoctrinated me into a sort of nonviolent revolutionaryism. I just used that word that I don't know if it's the word again. And so teachers, they have a profound effect. Most of them are awful. Some of them are profoundly good at accomplishing, influencing the students. I mean, really, realistically, for being honest, all teachers influence their students. The question is, do they influence them for the good or for the worse, right? Clearly this teacher, despite influencing Hitler, influence him into a fanaticism that he would never let go of. I'm so glad that Amaral influenced me towards nonviolence. First of all, because it's kept me out of quite a bit of trouble. So nonviolence in general is like a good thing, I believe. Um, But second of all, I think that it's actually useful. And so part of the reason that I'm going through this, I'm really spending a lot of time on education here and Hitler's view of education 
is because I think that we have a lot of problems in education today. I think it's useful for people to think deeply about, okay, Hitler, he was evil, but he was not dumb. And he was not, he was thinking deeply on a lot of problems. He just came to the wrong conclusions because his premises were so deeply flawed. The premise that racism is okay is so deeply flawed that it drove him to absolute the absolute lengths of destruction. So those are Hitler's schoolhood school years. He he got sick eventually and he dropped out of high school. He never completed high school and uh, he lived at home. And this is what Shire says. He says the next two or three years, Hitler often described as the happiest days of his life. While his mother suggested and other relatives urged that he go to work and learn a trade, he contented himself with dreaming of his future as an artist and with idling away the pleasant days along the Danube. He never forgot the downy softness of those years from 16 to 19 when, as a mother's darling, he enjoyed the hollowness of a comfortable life. Though the ailing widow found it difficult to make ends meet on her meager income, young Adolf declined to help out by getting a, by getting a job. The idea of earning even his own living by any kind of regular employment was repulsive to him and was to remain so throughout his life. Wow. Wow. A regular employment was repulsive to Adolf Hitler. And so on one hand, on the last page where he learns fanatical nationalism from a talented teacher, on the other hand, he learns the socialism part of national socialism from living at home and doing literally nothing. Uh, <laughs> Uh, this is so, I mean, we all know this kind of socialist in our life, right? Like the person, I mean, Bernie Sanders, right? Stayed home, did nothing, uh, contributed nothing to the world, but thinks that they have some deep, profound wisdom to impart to the entire world about the way the world should be run. This was Adolf Hitler from 16 to 19 doing nothing. It's funny because like on the last page when we were talking a little bit about education, I could, I was saying how much I felt like what he was saying was true, like it even applied to me in my own time in public education in the United States. Now I'm reading the flip side of that, the, the socialism side of the Hitler coin uh, where he didn't feel like it was necessary to work. I mean, I live in America where I'm sure that it was, it's been, it was probably a lot easier for my parents to get by in, you know, 21st century America with five kids than it was for Hitler's mom. And yet when I was 14 years old, the minute I could legally get a job, I went out and I got a job working at a dry cleaner. After I worked at the dry cleaner at 14, I went and worked at a caterer over the summer with a DJ. After the, I worked with the DJ, uh, I was 15. I worked at I worked as a dishwasher. I worked as a bakery in a bakery as a uh, barista. I worked at a Chick Fil A in college. You know, I never did not have a job from the point that I was 14 years old. Even when I was in school, I had a job. And this idea of working and earning what what you can and then contributing back to your people, that's something that Hitler didn't have, this sort of notion of Christian charity, this notion, uh, this, this very Christian notion that you are not a man if you do not provide for your family. That is something that Hitler did not have. And that's why I feel totally comfortable saying, hey, when Hitler says something I agree with, I'm going to say, hey, I kind of agree with that. Like we have the same problem today when it's clear where his other tendencies came from, this sort of tendency towards authoritarianism and believing that the state should provide all of the things for all of the people. I can see where that came from when you're someone who sees employment as repulsive, uh, but it's not an American concept. So Hitler was determined to become an artist, Shire goes on, preferably a painter or at least an architect. He was already obsessed with politics at the age of 16. By then, he had developed a violent hatred for the Habsburg monarchy and all the non-German races in the multinational Austro-Hungarian empire over which it ruled, and an equally violent love for everything German. At 16, he had become what he was to remain till his dying breath, a fanatical German nationalist. So on this one page, page 15 of the rise and fall of the third Reich, we have the socialist side of Hitler that didn't want to get a job, didn't want to provide for his family and the nationalist side of Hitler that thought that Germans were the highest possible race and everybody else was subhuman. This time of softness of abundance was Hitler's favorite time in life, his happiest time in life. 
and it was all about to come to an end. During this time, also, he was uh, rejected from the Vienna Academy of Fine Arts twice. He was not a skilled enough artist to become a painter. Um, they suggested he became un become an architect, and he couldn't become an architect because he never finished high school. So you can see how this sort of um, institutional rejection maybe contributed to his um, psychological need to control others, to attain retribution on those who mistreated him. On December 21st, 1908, as the town began to assume its festive Christmas garb, Adolf Hitler's mother died, and two days later, she was buried at Leonding beside her husband. To the 19-year-old youth, it was a dreadful blow. This is Hitler now. I had honored my father, but my mother I had loved. Her death put a sudden end to all my high-flown plans. Poverty and hard reality compelled me to take a quick decision. I was faced with the problem of somehow making my own living. Back to Shire. Somehow, he had no trade. He had always disdained manual labor. He had never tried to earn a cent, but he was undaunted. Imagine being 19 years old and having never had a job. That's just insane to me. I can't even imagine. Like, 20, I live in the 21st century, and I've, I've had a job for the last, for more than half of my life now, I've had a job. So I just cannot imagine, and I'm not even 30 yet, so I just can't even imagine what it would be like to be 19 and have never worked for yourself at all. Um, he was undaunted, bidding his relatives farewell. He declared that he would never return until he had made good with a suit. This is back to Hitler with a suitcase full of clothes and underwear in my hand and in, in and an indomitable will in my heart. I set out for Vienna. I too hoped to rest from fate that what my father had accomplished 50 years before, I too hoped to become something, but in no case a civil servant. The next four years between 1909 and 1913 turned out to be a time of utter misery and destitution for the conquering young man from Linz. So he moves to Vienna, which at the time was a like youthful, vigorous city, full of life, full of charm, sort of a center of industry in the region. He couldn't find a job because he was a lazy, good for nothing. I, I just I, I know that it's kind of political to go there, uh, but I just can't help but notice the, these commonalities between socialists like like Bernie Sanders has never had a job in private industry. Right. He's never had a job in private industry. He was a teacher, uh, he, and then he's worked as like the in the government for all these years. It's like very, very similar tra trajectory. People who think the government should take care of people generally don't know how to take care of themselves. And people who do know know how to take care of themselves are perfectly happy to give to charity and and contribute in in those ways as long as they are left alone to do that. Like good people who work hard are generally extremely charitable. It's the people who don't work hard, who are super lazy, that want to steal from others in order to provide for themselves. Back to Shire. There was a ferment in the life of the city. We're talking about Vienna, now grown to a population of two million. Democracy was forcing out the ancient autocracy of the Habsburgs. Education and culture were opening up to the masses so that by the time Hitler came to Vienna in 1909, there was opportunity for a penniless young man either to get a higher education or to earn a fairly decent living as one of a million wage earners. To live under the civilizing spell which the capital cast over its inhabitants was not his only friend, Kubizek, as poor and as obscure as himself, already making a name for himself in the Academy of Music, but the young Adolf did not pursue his ambition to enter the School of Architecture. It was still open for him despite his lack of high school diploma. Young men who showed special talent were admitted without such a certificate, but so far, as is known, he made no application, nor was he interested in learning a trade or taking any kind of regular employment. Instead, he preferred to putter about at odd jobs, shoveling snow, beating carpets, carrying bags outside of the West Railroad Station, occasionally for a few days working as a building laborer. In November 1909, less than a year after he arrived in Vienna to forestall fate, he was forced to abandon a furnished room in the Simon Dunk Gasse. And for the next four years, he lived in flop houses or in the almost equally miserable quarters of the men's hostel at 27 Meldemannstrasse in the 20th district of Vienna near the Danube, staving off hunger by frequenting a charity soup kitchen in the city. No wonder that nearly two decades later he would write, To me, Vienna, the city which so many is the epitome of innocent pleasure, a festive playground for merrymakers represents, I'm sorry to say, merely 
the living memory of the saddest period of my life. Even today, this city can arouse in me nothing but dismal thoughts. For me, the name of this facial facial city represents five years of hardship and misery five years in which i was forced to earn a living first as a day laborer then as a small painter a truly meager living which never sufficed to appease even my daily hunger always he says these times there was hunger hunger was then my faithful bodyguard he never left me for a moment and partook of all that i had my life was a continual struggle with this pitiless friend hmm hmm it just sounds so familiar when i hear about like the way Bernie Sanders lived as a young man because they're socialists. <laughs> it's not funny. It's actually sad. I mean, poverty is sad, but when the person refuses to work or get a real job, it is a reflection of their own character. It is a reflection of who that person actually is. And you can't sit here and tell me it's not who Adolf Hitler actually was. Adolf Hitler was as bad as he is being portrayed right here. He is actually worse. He's so much worse. And then we'll go on to his career as a painter. What he did was draw or paint some crude little pictures of Vienna, usually of some well-known landmarks such as St. Stephen's Cathedral, the Opera House, the Berg Theater, the Palace of Schoenbrunn, or the Roman ruins in Schoenbrunn Park. According to his acquaintances, he copied them from older works. Apparently, he could not draw from nature. They are rather stilted and lifeless, like a beginning architect's rough and careless sketches, and the human figures he sometimes added are so bad as to remind one of a comic strip. I find a note of my own made once after going through a portfolio of Hitler's original sketches, few faces, crude, one almost ghoulish face. To Haydn, they stand like tiny stuffed sacks outside the high, solemn palaces. Probably hundreds of these pitiful pieces were sold by Hitler to the petty traders to ornament a wall, to dealers who use them to fill empty picture frames on display, and to furniture makers who sometimes tacked them to the backs of cheap sofas and chairs after a fashion in Vienna in those days. Hitler could also be more commercial. He often drew posters for shopkeepers advertising such products as Teddy's perspiration powder, and there was perhaps turned out to make a little money at Christmas time depicting Santa Claus selling brightly colored candles and another showing St. Stephen's Gothic Spire, which Hitler never tired of copying. I want to stop there and just think about art for a minute, that he was maybe decent at painting things, but he could not for the life of him paint a person. There's sort of a saying in some circles that socialists love humankind, but they hate individual humans. And I think this actually is sort of an, this is that. This is Hitler being able to draw a building, but not being able to draw a person. His inability to focus on the individual as having in, as having in itself worth for even the, like the time it would take to draw a portrait. It's not like rocket science to become halfway decent at drawing portraits, by the way, especially if you think that you're going to become an artist. We're going to step next into something that I think is actually pretty interesting, something that maybe we can learn from. Hitler talks a lot about reading in Mein Kampf, and uh, it really says a lot about his thought process around learning in general. And there's two things here. One is that I think that he makes some really g genuinely valuable points about how to read and how reading should be done. Uh, and then he makes some terrible points about, about how we should continue reading later in life. So in Mein Kampf, Hitler discourses at length on the art of reading. By reading, to be sure, I mean perhaps something different than the average member of our so-called intelligentsia. He's so patronizing. <laughs> I know well people who read enormously, yet whom I would not describe as well-read. True, they possess a mass of knowledge, but their brain is unable to organize and register the material they have taken in. On the other hand, a man who possesses the art of correct reading will instinctively and immediately perceive everything which, in his opinion, is worth permanently knowing, either because it is suited to his purpose or generally worth knowing. The art of reading as of learning is this, to retain the essential and to forget the non-essential. Only this kind of reading has meaning and purpose. Viewed in this light, my Vienna period was especially fertile and valuable. This is deeply true. I think that this is actually the right way to read. This is the way. So I've now read this chapter three or four times, maybe five times. And this is, it's not the way that I read it the first time, right? Like I didn't just read the chapter the first time to get specific actionable items out of it. I read the chapter to get acquainted with sort of the general content of the chapter. But beyond that, the way I've read this chapter is to find the essential things. I'm only reading to you the things that I think essential in this book. It's amazing. Like this is how I know that he was a smart person at base because he knew how to gather information that he thought was valuable and, and create 
and being a valuable person means being able to, to identify value. Clearly, people thought that Hitler was going to be a good thing for them. So he knew how to distill valuable things. At the end of the day, the problem was his own lack of humility, the fact that he was possessed by false ideologies of racism and, and German superiority, which he goes into. Vienna was and remained for me the hardest and most thorough school of my life. I had set foot in this town while still half a boy and left it a man grown quiet and grave. In this period, there took shape in me a world picture and a philosophy which became the granite foundation of all of my acts. In addition to what I then created, I have had to learn little. I have had to learn little, and I have had to alter nothing. Wow. Wow. So he's in Vienna for just a handful of years, and he's reading voraciously during this time. And he says that he has had to learn nothing since his time in Vienna. It's incredible to me that he can be so right about the micro tactics of reading specifically, but he can be so wrong about the macro reading over the course of your life and having to learn as you go along. Uh, you know, I'm a software engineer in my day to day life, and we know that constant learning is the objective. You never know everything you need to know. You are probably wrong about many, many things, and you need to correct the things that you're wrong about. Hitler didn't get that. Hitler thought that he had learned everything that he needed to know in just a few years of reading at Vienna. So now let's get into some of the politics, some of the political ideas. What were these political ideas that he picked up? in Vienna. Back to Shire. They were, with one exception, not original, but picked up raw from the churning maelstrom of Austrian politics and life in the first years of the 20th century. The Danube monarchy was dying of indigestion. For centuries, a minority of German Austrians had ruled over the polyglot empire of a dozen nationalities and stamped out their language, and I'm sorry, and stamped their language and their culture on it. But since 1848, their hold had been weakening. I'll just point out that this is a really great argument that it's almost impossible to keep an empire when there is no national language. Austria was not a melting pot. In the 1860s, the Italians had broken away, and in 1867, the Hungarians had won equality with the Germans under a so-called dual monarchy. Now, as the 20th century began, the very Slav peoples, the Czechs, the Slovaks, the Serbs, and the Croats, and many others were demanding equality and at least national autonomy. You see these different cultures, Austrian politics, this is what Shire continues to say. He says, Austrian politics had become dominated by the bitter quarrel of nationalities. So this is actually where I take issue with Shire. He's saying it's a bitter quarrel of, quarrel of nationalities, but that's not how it reads to me. To me, this reads like a quarrel between ethnicities, races, and cultures, okay? And in fact, he goes on to admit it. He says, this was not all. There was social revolt, revolt too, and this often transcended the racial struggle. So races are not nationalities, are not ethnicities. And I think that Shire sort of conflates these things because he has a predisposition away from nationalism. And so he wants to blame these Austrian politics and power dynamics on nationalism. But in fact, I think that these are ethnic and cultural disputes and sort of disputes of autonomy. And I don't think that any of these people were actually wrong in asserting their right to self-determination. If they do not have, if they do not share cultural values with the unifying German, German sort of, government then why not decide for themselves to be independent that's their right people have a right to self-determination and so this is the milieu that uh hitler develops in and there are three main parties at this time that he's studying and he's studying deeply he's studying the social democrats the christian socialists and the pan-german nationalists now these are all awful political parties one thing that i i think seems to be like a trend in European politics is one multi-party systems and two, the fact that all the parties are totally awful. <laughs> um, so in this case, they're all awful. They're all awful because the pan German nationalists are basically saying that Germans should rule over, over everybody else. And then the social Democrats and the Christian socialists are socialists. So like Europe at this point still had not figured out that freedom, that classical liberalism is the way for diverse peoples to live in harmony with one another. So this is Hitler now. I'm sorry, this is Shire talking about Hitler. At home, he began to read the social democratic press. So this is the social democrat party. They have their own press. Every party has their own press. <laughs> Reading this is what has at least partially made it clear to me that a multi-party system, like more than two, is 
is is just not a good idea. Like it actually doesn't work very well. So at home, he began to read the social democratic press. They all have their own press. The social democrats have their own press. All the parties have their own press. Examine and and so he was examining the speeches of its leaders, studying its organization, reflecting on its psychology and political techniques, and pondering the results. He came to three conclusions, which explained to him the success of the social democrats. They knew how to create a mass movement. They knew how to create a mass movement without which any political party was useless. So without a mass movement, political parties are useless. The Democrats in America really know about this. Actually, the the Republicans do too, right? The Tea Party was a mass movement. Populism. The reason populism really works in the United States is we only have two parties, and so each party becomes a populist movement in its own way, just different populations. They knew how to create a mass movement without which any political party was useless. They had learned the art of propaganda among the masses, and finally they knew the value of using what he calls spiritual and physical terror. This is Hitler now. I understood the infamous spiritual terror which this movement exerts, particularly particularly on the bourgeoisie, which is neither morally nor mentally equal to such attacks. At a given sign, it unleashes a veritable barrage of lies and slanders against whatever adversary seems most dangerous until the nerves of the attacked persons break down. This is a tactic based on precise calculation of all human weaknesses, and its result will lead to success with almost mathematical certainty. I achieved an equal understanding of the importance of physical terror towards the individual and the masses for while in the ranks of their supporters the the victory achieved seems a triumph of the justice of their own cause the defeated adversary in most cases despairs of the success of any further resistance oh my gosh it's almost like the social democrats (laughs) the social democrats in in early 20th century Germany sound a lot like the Democrats in the United States today. Think about this spiritual terror, spiritual terror. When the Democrats tell women that the pro-life right wants to control their bodies, that sounds like spiritual terror to me. Physical terror toward the individual and the masses. Bernie Sanders Field campaign organizers saying that they're going to put people who disagree with them into gulags sounds like physical terror. Antifa sounds like physical terror. Beating up Andy, no, all all that stuff. It's physical and spiritual terror, and it's it's right out of the same playbook that Hitler learned from. Incredible, incredible. And they'll tell you they'll tell you that the Nazis were not socialists, even though it's in their name, National Socialist German Workers Party. They'll tell you the Nazis weren't socialists, but they learned from the socialists. They definitely learned from the socialists. In fact, he admitted right there, Hitler himself in his own words, describing how he learned about spiritual and physical terror toward the individual and the masses from the social democrats of early 20th century Germany. And then he goes on to his admiration of the pan-Germanic movement. This movement's inadequate appreciation of the importance of the social problem cost it the truly militant mass of the people. Again, this is the pan-German party, different party now. Its entry into parliament took away its mighty impetus and burdened it with all the weaknesses peculiar to this institution. The struggle against the Catholic Church robbed it of countless of the best elements of that nation the, of the best elements that the nation can call its own so this is hitler basically saying that the pan germans the pan german nationalists um did not sufficiently generate a mass movement and they also uh failed to create an alliance with the catholic church in fact they uh they they, they attempted to move away from the catholic church which uh hitler thought was a mistake although he he, he made the same uh, error in his own time, he, I mean, they, they just all hated Christians, right? Like, <laughs> because Christianity does not um, yield power the way other, uh, the way secular peoples do. You know, se- secularism is just the search for a religion in the state. So, it was the failure of the pan Germans to arouse the masses, their inability to even understand the psychology of the common people, that to Hitler constituted their biggest mistake. Okay, and then the third, the third major party at the time was the Christian Socialists. What did Hitler learn from them? Well, there was one political leader in Vienna in Hitler's time, this is Shire now, who understood this as well as the necessity of building a party on the foundation of the masses. This was Dr. Karl Luger, the burgomaster of Vienna and the leader of the Christian Social Party, who more than any other 
and became Hitler's political mentor. Though the two never met, Hitler always regarded him as the greatest German mayor of all times, a statesman greater than all of the so-called diplomats of the time. If Dr. Karl Luger had lived in Germany, he would have been ranked among the great minds of our people. Dr. Karl Luger had been a brilliant orator, but the pan-German party had lacked effective public speakers. So this is Hitler learning the importance of oratory. Hitler took notice of this and in Mein Kampf makes much of the importance of oratory in politics. This is Hitler now. The power, the power, which has always started the greatest religious and political avalanches in history, rolling, rolling has from time immemorial been a, the magic power of the spoken word and that alone. Let's read that again. The power which has always started the greatest religious and political avalanches in history rolling from time immemorial has been the magic power of the spoken word and that alone. I've got a great book here on my shelf. The Origins of Consciousness and the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind goes into the evolutionary psychology behind why people are so moved by the spoken word. Everyone should read this book. Quick digression there. Going back to the oratory. Hitler speaks the, I'm sorry, Hitler writes in Mein Kampf, the broad masses of the people can be moved only by the power of speech. All great movements are popular movements, volcanic eruptions of human passions and emotional sentiments stirred either by the cruel goddess of distress or by the firebrand of the world of the word hurled among the masses. They are not the lemonade like outpourings of the literary aesthetes and drawing room heroes. The broad masses of the people can only be moved by the power of of speech that is something that i think we really believed i mean we know it to be true now from obama to trump it's obvious right i mean all of, all of our presidents have been fairly decent orators but i think now we're really zooming in on the fact that oratory is how the masses are moved to uh, extremes and then finally how did Hitler come to hate the Jews? How did Hitler come to such a, a place of ideological possession, of absolute hatred, of disgust, that he w would become who he became? This is the end of the chapter. This is the end of Hitler's time in Vienna, and perhaps the most important part of his time in Vienna. In Hitler's Vienna experience, there were the Jews. In Linz, he says, there have been few Jews. At home, I do not remember having heard the word during my father's lifetime. At high school, there was a Jewish boy, but he didn't, but we didn't give the matter any thought. I even took the Jews for Germans. According to Hitler's boyhood friend, though, this is not true. When I first met Adolf Hitler, says August Kubizek, recalling their days together in Linz, his anti-Semitism was already pronounced. Hitler was already a confirmed anti-Semite when he went to Vienna. When he went to Vienna, when he was 19, this, all these anti-Semitic ideas were instilled in him at a very early age. This is the canary in the coal mine. I mean, we see it today, the anti-Semitism on the left, the anti-Zionism on the left. We see it today. It's being instilled in children at a very young age by the teachers. And we're seeing it today. And this is what led to Hitler. Okay? This is the sort of ideological possession that led to Hitler. But Hitler says that he, it wasn't until he came to Vienna Preoccupied by the abundance of my impressions, this is Hitler, oppressed by the hardship on my own lot, I gained at first no insight into the inner stratification of the people in this gigantic city, notwithstanding that Vienna in those days counted nearly 200,000 Jews among its 2 million inhabitants. I did not see them. The Jew was still characterized for me by nothing but his religion, and therefore, on grounds of human tolerance, I maintained my rejection of religious attacks, in this case as in others. Consequently, the tone of the Viennese anti-Semitic press seemed to me unworthy of the cultural tradition of a great nation. One day, Hitler recounts, he went strolling through the inner city. I suddenly encountered an apparition in a black caftan and black side locks. Is this a Jew? was my first thought. For to be sure, they had not looked like that in Linz. I observed the man furtively and cautiously, but the longer I stared at this foreign face, scrutinizing feature for feature, the more my first question assumed a new form. Is this a German? Hitler's answer may be readily guessed. He claims, though, that before answering, he decided to try to relieve my doubts by books. 
he buried himself in anti-Semitic literature, which had a large sale in Vienna at the time. Then he took to the streets to observe the phenomenon more closely. Wherever I went, he says, I began to see Jews, and the more I saw, the more sharply they became distinguished in my eyes from the rest of humanity. Later, I often grew sick to my stomach from these, the smell of these caftan wearers. Next, he says he discovered the moral stain on this chosen people. Was there any form of filth or profligacy, particularly in cultural life, without at least one Jew involved in it? I won't even say this. I, so I don't want to read this because it's just it's very offensive to me. I've got Jewish people in my family and, and I just don't want to read. I don't I don't want to continue to go through this and sort of and, and say the words that he's saying. There's a lot of bad language here. Um, there's a morbid sexuality in the nature of a lot of things that he says. Um, I don't think it's actually necessary. We know that Hitler hated Jews, right? The point is that is that this was something instilled in him from a very early age. He was in Vienna at a very, you know, when he was 19, but he went to Vienna already with a hatred of the Jews. Later, after Vienna, he would move to Munich. And then the second chapter of this book is on the birth of the Nazi party. And it will go into his time in the military service. He did military time. Uh, but that's not for today. We've already gone really long today. And uh, I appreciate you sticking with me. That's a little bit on the early life of Hitler. If you come back next time, you hit that subscribe button. Hit that like button if you enjoyed it. And then come back next time. We'll continue going through the rise and the fall of the Third Reich. Massive book by William Shire. I'm Justice Epen. Yeah, come back next time for more on the rise and fall of the Third Reich.